Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today on the Dungeon Dive, we are taking a look at Sandbox Generator from Atelier Clandestine. I purchased the physical book from Drive-Thru RPG, and in order to show it better on this video, I have printed out the PDF that I also received with my purchase. Sandbox Generator is, in my opinion, worth its weight in fantasy bucks. <laughs> this book is worth its weight in gold. Sometimes a book comes along and it just hits all of the right spots for me. And this is one of those books. This book has triggered within me a, a, a desire to play within its parameters more so than any other book has in a very long time. I absolutely love the Sandbox Generator. I love it so much that I am working on a project that I'm going to give to Dungeon Dive patrons, and that is going to be a series of pre-keyed hex tiles that you can print out and use to start off a, a, a solo campaign or use to kind of maybe trigger some of your own ideas. And right here we have the first one that I have released so far, and this is Hex Tile A, I'm calling it, 19 Hex, uh, 19 hex Hex Tile. We have things like forests and marshes and hills and grasslands, and then we have various settlements, dungeons, uh, layers, and various landmarks and an abbey as well. And then here we have our key uh, information here. So the center hex here, we have hex uh, A1. This is a village called Zelik and Loy. It's a medium-sized village with a population of 100. Uh, neutral disposition, horse stables, a guard post with eight guards. It has a market. Their main trade is pottery. Uh, they are protected by wooden palisades. Their leader is a merchant who is welcoming. Uh, notable NPCs are a lonely widow and an annoying minstrel. One thing that I did like that I rolled up uh, while creating this hex tile here is this other uh, village here called uh, Nisma Mount. It's a small village with a population of 50. It also has a neutral disposition. It's known for its church and for its uh, its main trade is mining. And it uses the dungeons found in hexes uh, 3 and 8 for uh, mine for its mining excavations and it is uh, built on a mound its leader is a lycanthrope and its notable npc i rolled up was a werewolf hunter so i think that combination right there will make for some uh, for some interesting interactions in that particular village of nisma mount and then we also have uh, magic uh, magic hex where all the trees are dead maybe some npcs are in need uh, stuck or bogged down we have a few dungeons on this hex tile here, and those are called the Morning Labyrinth. And then we have the Unholy Cells, the Deadly Corridors, and the Destroyed Burrows. The neat thing about Sandbox Generator is uh, how detailed it gets in creating the dungeons. And we'll I'll go through that in just a moment here. But there are all kinds of interesting things that I created just on this one little hex tile. And I think I could have a series of really fun adventures just playing on one little hex tile like this. But I wanted to show you what I made. So I printed out uh, some hex paper and then I glued it to some thin chipboard there. And then I made a series of them. So I made, uh, how many? I made five hexes and then I made a couple odd shapes here. Kind of like Hexplore it. And then I can just take these and when I want to play, you know, I can combine them to make interesting shapes for a land that I want to explore. And it can kind of, you know, change things up on the fly, put things in different places and uh, stuff like that. So I think I think this will be a lot of fun to uh, to do this, to just kind of create a random world from pre keyed hexes. I think that is a very kind of a, a valuable way to spend my time to make these and then I can get a lot of use out of them. Okay, but let's uh, take a look here at uh, the sandbox generator in detail. Over here, you are seeing just a really quick preview of my game, The Hall of Heroes, a solo role-playing game of heroic adventure. I am going to be using the sandbox generator 
to help facilitate some of the adventure prompts in my game. And, and very soon we will be making a few designer diary videos on Hall of Heroes, possibly, uh, possibly by next week. But here we have Sandbox Generator. We have our table of contents here. So we go through the different uh, things. You start big and you work in uh, small. You work down into the nitty gritty. You have things like biomes, um, encounters per biome, features, factions, random encounters, and an example of how to do all of that. You have various landmarks, various settlements, layers and dungeons, and then a whole section on random generators and a small section of adventures at sea. Uh, a brief introduction here. You will be using some D30s and some D24s. And if you don't have those handy, it tells how you can roll those. For example, if you needed a D30, you could roll a D6 along with a D20. On a 1, 2, or a 3, just keep the D20. On a 4, 5, or 6, add 10. And so that would be a 9. If that was a 4, 5, or 6, that would be a 19. Pretty easy to do there. So here we have our basic hex map. Now this game uses a two mile hex. I think a two mile hex for me personally is a little too small. I like the six mile hex. You have six miles from face to face. You have seven miles from point to point and then uh, from one point to the center and one edge is 3.5 miles. I prefer the seven mile hex. I think it makes sense for me more in my mind thinking about how things are laid out, about how big things are. A two mile hex to me seems too small. It seems like there would be not enough empty space to have further exploration. So I will make all of mine using a six mile hex. One place where this game falls a little short, where this uh, tool falls a little short, possibly is in the variants of the biomes. So we have grasslands, forest, hills, marsh, and mountains. Uh, missing are deserts, jungles, and I like to have some kind of like wasteland or a barren land. Very, very easy to add though. I just uh, maybe uh, instead of a grassland, maybe you roll up a desert. Instead of a forest, maybe you roll up a jungle. Instead of a marsh, maybe you roll up a wasteland. And then uh, what I did here is for the next hex, because you want to roll up your initial hex first. So let's take, uh, let me find hex tile B here. So I think hex tile B will be the next uh, hex that I will that I will key. I have my chart here so I can just kind of write it here so that way I don't have to uh, draw on the hex live on camera so I don't make a mistake. So uh, you want to start in uh, B1. So B1 will be our first hex here. And let's see what our starting hex will be. It'll be a D10, uh, a five. It'll be a forest. Okay, so you could say, well, maybe I want to start in a jungle, but I will start in a forest here. So the forest is a biome there. Okay, so then you want to work around in a kind of a circle-like pattern. So you kind of have a gradual progression of different biomes. One thing that I might start doing is if I have two grasslands in a row, the next hex has a one in six chance of being a desert. If I have two forests in a row, the next hex has a one in six chance of being a jungle. If I have two marshes in a row, the next hex has a one in six chance of being a wastelands or something like that. And this book encourage you, encourages uh, the, the player, the creator, the GM, or the solo player to work in 19 hex areas and then combine those together. And so this is what triggered me, what sparked my uh, creativity, my uh, desire to craft these little tiles was actually to make these as physical tiles so then I could combine them together in other ways. You could also just continue to work out in this spiral fashion in order to make your uh, in order to, to, to make your hex tile. So if B1 was a forest, uh, the next tile I would uh, start on is B2 or the next hex. So then you could roll up on your next hex here. So forest and a seven. So the next is a forest also. So B2 would also be a forest and so on. And you would just kind of work around like that. There's my B tile. I knew I had it somewhere. Okay, so you also have some uh, encounter charts for when you need an encounter for biomes. So you have grasslands, marsh, mountains, forest, and hills. Of course, if you are adding things like jungles or barren wastelands or deserts, you will also need uh, a, a nice little encounter chart for those. You can find some of those in other things like White Box or Scarlet Heroes or any other uh, book that you might want to use for your random encounters. 
And then we have here, we have uh, features here. So this is the starting hex is always a settlement. You don't have to play like that, but it is a good place, a good uh, way to start. So we could say that our B1 here, it's a forest and it's some kind of settlement. And then the next hex would be uh, B2. So let's see what kind of uh, feature would be found on B2. You would roll up a D6 here and it would be a dungeon. Okay, so there would be a dungeon right next to the settlement. And then of course you could have your settlement there as a village. And then uh, this little door here, you could draw that for that could be your, your, your dungeon. So we have dungeons, landmarks, abbeys, layers, and villages. Then you also have things like castles and hamlets and cities and towers, wizards, towers, and things like that. So the settlements in this game are divided into two different sizes. We have hamlets and villages, and those are small. And then we have cities, castles, towers, and abbeys, and those are considered large. And any large settlement will uh, have a faction associated with it. And the factions can actually have control on the map of various contiguous uh, hexes or um, their own hex. If it's a small uh, settlement, they might only have uh, some faction control over the one hex that they are in. But larger settlements and larger areas will have more faction control. And the game encourages you to work in layers. And so I might just want to take something like this 19 hex tile, put that on a piece of paper and then have my faction map as an additional layer that I can look at. Because as the game, as your games progress, your your faction control will start to change. And so we might have two castles here. Uh, this castle is represented by uh, lines going in this direction. And this castle here is represented by lines going in the opposite direction. And then the hex where they meet, where those lines cross over, that is a contested hex. So that might be a hex of interest where maybe there is some political intrigue going on within that hex. That is a good hex for adventure. And so that's how you would create your political map, the, the layer of your political map. And then here, as pairs of factions are neighboring, have neighboring territories, you can roll to see uh, what the relationship is, if it's open war, through alliance. Um, you can have different events that are happening in those contested hexes. You might have an event that is that just ended, is happening now, or will take place in the future. And then you have this D12 chart here to roll up on what kind of political event is happening. Perhaps there's a curse of some kind. Maybe one faction is uh, has some witches and they are cursing the other factions. And then it also tells you how to handle random encounters within your hexes. You can roll everything from a dragon to another faction, the controlling faction, NPCs, the biome uh, chart that you might want to roll on uh, back here, or perhaps a wizard. And there is also a very detailed uh, set of generators to roll up random wizards. And then we get into a nice example that covers everything that this uh, preceding chapter just covered. So all of the examples in this book are super detailed and very helpful. Okay, and then we get into landmarks. So as you start creating your hexes, you want to find out what is in those hexes as kind of a starting point. You know, these landmarks aren't always going to be around, but this is a really good kind of initial seed for your um, for your adventure. So let's say I was on hex B3 and it was a forest, okay? Um, First roll on this table. Let's see what kind of landmark would be there. Uh, three, it would be a natural landmark. Okay, so a natural landmark. So there might be something additional there. It might be a hazard. It might be empty. I think empty is kind of the wrong word for it. Uh, it might be a special landmark or there might be some monsters with a variable um, amount of treasure that you might be able to find. If it's a hazard, there might be a 25% chance of there being a great treasure there. If it's empty, there might be a 15% chance. A uh, special is a variable chance of being uh, of there being a great treasure. And if there are monsters, there's a 50% chance of being a great treasure. When I say empty, empty just means that there's not something particularly dangerous or uh, outwardly interesting about that hex. However, you might find information and each one of these has a sub table that you can roll on. 
So we have a whole, we have 36 different natural landmarks from animal boneyards to chasms to root arches, uh, ravines, ponds, rapids, water filled caves. We have artificial landmarks such as different kinds of farms, different kinds of labor areas, uh, maybe uh, some masks, a pile of bones, a gazebo, a level uh, 10 gazebo there. Um, uh, religious uh, relics, holy places, idols, shrines, uh, bridges, broken bridges, bridges, a signboard, stairs, different kinds of ruins. And then we have magical landmarks, so areas under a spell. It's always snowing or it's a destroyed golem laying covered with moss on the floor, an enchanted item, magical fruit trees or a sword stuck in a rock, a magical path, a levitating staircase, an illusion path. Uh, maybe a strange phenomenon like a reverse waterfall or a place of power. So all kinds of different landmarks that you can roll up. And then we have uh, D20 hazards. So you have acid pits, ghosts, and plagues, all kinds of different hazards. When your hex is empty, you will roll on this chart here. And it is a D20 roll. And you might find info about monsters, maybe a clue about the ecology, the layer, maybe a clue about the weakness of a particularly strong monster that is somewhere else. Uh, you might find some kind of alchemy recipe, a password of some kind, maybe a secret passage to a secret location, something like that. And then you might have these uh, special hexes, which you might have to deal with a little bit more of an adventure associated with them, such as... Uh, six here. Um, uncover a mystery. Okay, so what kind of mystery? Uh, a D10. Uh, t a two. There's an alleged ghost in this hex. Okay, so how are you going to deal with that? Why is that alleged ghost there? And then again, we have an example of all of that. And then we get into our very detailed section on settlements. It goes through how to create hamlets, villages, cities, castles, towers, and abbeys with a very detailed naming system here. So to figure out how you name your settlement, first you will roll a D30. So we'll add 10, so we have a 20 there. A 20 is D ton. So that means we're going to take, we're going to roll on chart D and add ton to the name. So let's find chart D here. Uh, D is a D24. I'm just gonna roll a D20. 11, Canthton. Okay, so we have a settlement named Canthton. So we have all these different ways to name your settlements and then different layouts of your hamlets, what kind of buildings your hamlet might be in, what the disposition is, and do they have a secret? And then we have our villages with the different sizes, the main occupation that your village focuses on. We have points of interest, what kind of defense they have, the disposition, the disposition of the leader. We have different uh, notable NPCs, different secrets, and different events that might be happening, uh, just happened, is happening now, or will take place in the future, like our uh, political events that we looked at uh, earlier. And then we get into our cities, and again, the cities add even more. We have a characteristic, an appearance, kind of like the main architecture. We have various points of interest, special locations, such as a cavalry, a fountain, um, a military cemetery. We have buildings of interest, different kinds of housing, and all kinds of different businesses, official buildings, uh, religious buildings, public areas, what kind of uh, military structures are there, your city's defense, uh, more people, more events in your city. And then we get into castles, and castles are even bigger, so there's even more stuff to roll up on castles. And then we have a whole bunch of things to roll up on uh, magical towers. And these are really cool. These, this magical tower stuff, have they have different levels. And the different levels might be associated with different things like sorcery or alchemy or things like that. And then abbeys. I think this is super cool. A little uh, whole little sub chapter on how to create an abbey, what it's called, the kind of gods it worships, maybe what kind of saints are there. Uh, what, uh, what kind of land the abbey is structured around, additional locations. You might have a garden, infirmary, religious buildings, and then what kind of activities the monks or the nuns are uh, do during their day-to-day -day life. And then we move into a layers section. So layers are small little enclaves of monsters, of bandits, of things that the heroes might want to fight. 
and the layers come in five different sizes. So you have well, one area, two area, three, four, and five. And then depending on how many creatures you roll up, each one of those areas will contain a percentage of those creatures. And then there is another chance that a certain percentage of the creatures might be roaming around a neighboring hex. So that's super cool because it creates this kind of relationship between the layer and its neighboring hexes. And then we get into the dungeon section. Now the dungeon section is where this book gets a little complex in a good way because not only are the dungeons individual places where you might be able to explore with multiple levels and multiple rooms, but there is a chance that every single dungeon on your 19 hex tile uh, can be connected to other dungeons, thus creating the chance of a mega dungeon underneath the ground. Uh, deep within the, the bowels of the earth. And so maybe you go into a dungeon in A5 and you come out at the surface at A8. And so we have up to uh, six different dungeons per uh, 19 hexes. I think that's a good number. And then each one of those dungeons can be uh, one through six levels deep. So when you have your dungeon number one, whatever that is, you would roll. Okay, so dungeon number one is six levels deep. And then you roll a certain amount of dice to figure out how many rooms each of the layers has. So you might have uh, one, you know, five rooms, 20 rooms, 15, 30, and 12 rooms or something like that. And then the closest level to the surface level is where you enter the dungeon. So you might have uh, dungeon number two might start on level four. And so that's a very deep uh, pathway you have to travel through before you even get to the first layer of that dungeon. Maybe uh, you have uh, 12 rooms, 32 and 12 rooms, but maybe you might roll up that dungeon number one on the fourth floor actually connects to dungeon uh, number two on the fifth floor. And so you can create these really elaborate and intricate passageways that lead from one dungeon to the next. And there are a whole bunch of things to roll up on dungeons. I think even the dungeon section of this book is worth the price of admission because you have all of your different levels. You have a bestiary uh, uh, lookup charts for your various levels. You have ways to handle wandering monsters ways that the different monsters might be involved in factions and having relationships with each other. With each other. You have various layers that could be little sub-dungeons within the dungeons. And then we have all kinds of ways to roll up our structure of our dungeon from our corridors to our rooms to the different types of treasure doors and secret doors. And then we have a whole bunch of magic doors, traps, different things you might find in empty rooms. Again, they're not really empty. Empty just means that it's not super important. And then a D100 chart for special rooms and all of the special rooms have their own rules. So we have things you could discover like advanced technology, a boss monster, a cleaning receptacle, a devouring coin, a demon trap, a dungeon tavern, an emergency exit, an evil altar, the heart of the dungeon, a golden apple tree, an item up high, a maddening mural, a hungry mouth, an illusory treasure, a medicine cabinet, a magic forge, just all kinds of awesome things that you can find in your dungeons. And then here we have an example of how you might want to create your dungeon levels and layers and how they might interact with each other. So in this example here, dungeons one, two, and three form one mega dungeon and dug dungeons four and five form another mega dungeon. There's no connection between those two, at least not you know, on this page here. You might roll up a C, you might find a secret uh, passage that actually leaves from level four of dungeon three all the way to level five of dungeon five. Who knows? And then here we have a, an example of how to actually roll up your structured dungeon. And then finally, finally, we get into a set of random generators. And this book has an insanely detailed uh, collection of generators to roll up a coat of arms. I have never seen something like this in a game before, 
But if you want to come up with a coat of arms for your your large settlements, your kingdoms, man, you totally could. You've got a way like a main shape, the different field divisions of your coat of arms, uh, the colors, the different tools and weapons that might be associated with your coat of arms or a helm, the crest, uh, different supporters, a banner, a uh, compartment. So you have all kinds of different ways to roll up coat of arms. That's kind of cool. If you want to come up with a criminal organization that's maybe in one of your villages or cities, some, some kind of uh, secret underground faction, you have a whole different bunch of charts to roll up criminal organizations there. Um, different ways to roll up dragons. I'm not particularly fond of dragons in fantasy games. I'm not a big dragon guy, but I know some people are. So, hey, if you like dragons, you can roll up random dragons here with a name with names and different stats and attacks and damages and weaknesses and all kinds of things like that. We have uh, different guilds. So you can roll up all of your different guilds that might have power within your cities. Uh, members of your guilds, what their expertise is, what power they have, their union power. And then what else do we have? Different ways that you can lay out houses. So a noble house, a merchant house, and a peasant house. Um, a whole bunch of really cool charts to come up with NPCs with first names, surnames, a D100 list of occupations, uh, their personality, appearances, what their dreams are, what their secrets are, what their hobbies are. A whole section on generating taverns. You guys know I love generating taverns, so this is another really handy tool to have to generate more random taverns uh, with some rumors that you might find in your taverns there. Uh, different uh, ways to come up with your signage for your tavern. How cool is that? Let's roll up a let's roll up a, a sign here. All right, a D20. So uh, I'm gonna grab. Let's see. Let's grab this. Let's maybe. Uh, okay, a D25. It is a round sign. OK, so this is my tavern it has a round sign. I guess we need to come up with a name, though. Let's see. What's the name of our tavern here? Uh, where is the tavern names? Here we go. All right. First part and second part. First part is a D100. So we've got 44. Uh, this is the hanging and a D. I'm just going to roll a D20, the hanging. Keg. Hey, that's cool. So the hanging keg. OK, so this sign is going to be hanging like this. Uh, maybe we have a keg there like that. And then let's see, what's it made out of a D12? Uh, it is made out of a stone. Oh, wow, a big stone sign. Hopefully that doesn't drop on somebody's head and sue. And then they sue the uh, the uh, the owner of the inn. Uh, the position. Where is it? Where is this hanging on your tavern? Uh, six, it is hanging perpendicular to the facade. Uh, what is it mounted with? I mean, just so, just so much detail. You can get into the nitty gritty of everything if you want. What kind of illustrations are surrounding your keg? Um, is it a special sign? Maybe it's a magical sign. Um, but there's a, an example of a sign that they rolled up called the Red Oak Family Business with a rabbit there. Super, super cool. Uh, we, then we get into our, I think this is one of the last sections here where we get into how to roll up a detailed chart on rolling up a wizard because uh, wizard towers are important to the structure of this tool. And so it is important to have access to the ability to roll up random wizards. And then finally, finally, we have a little small section on C. I'm thinking of taking one of my odd shaped tiles here and making this kind of a coastline that I could add to an additional tile to have a few little hexes that I can go out and have some sea adventures because maybe you might find an atoll or a jungle, a rocky, a volcanic islands or different kinds of landmarks at sea. And you have some different locations that you can find at sea. Personally, I want an entire book made just for adventures at sea using this similar style. So, yeah. That is a very kind of detailed overview look at Sandbox Generator. I think it's like 20 bucks or something, $18 for the paperback and access to the PDF. I have loved my time. I've had this book for about a week and a half and I have been reading it and using it constantly. It has sparked my imagination more so than just about any other book of its kind. I just find it really inspiring and I find that it makes me want to create these areas to play in 
And in that sense, I think this is one of the best sandbox generators that I have ever used. You're going to be seeing this a lot. We'll be talking about it in more kind of detail on how I am using it as we go through my designer diaries for my game that I am making called the Hall of Heroes. So, all right, you guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this look at the sandbox generator and we will talk to you later. Bye bye.